Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pat, when Pastor was saying, I am a product of this church, I, I agree 100%. I so love this church. This has been really the only church I know, and I can't imagine being anywhere else. So I do love this church and all the people who's poured into my life as I've grown up. It's just, I can't thank you enough. And what a great night with these wonderful graduates. I, as I sat there, I'm not going to lie, Brother Shane, as I've seen them, I've seen them grow and I've, I begin to, I've been able to pour into them and teach them. I just, I got a little emotional, just a little bit. I, I had to fight a couple of tears back, uh, but it, it's a great time. And it's such an honor to stand in this pulpit in front of my church family. Uh, to, to say I was nervous is, would be a lie. If you see something protruding from my chest, it's my heart. It's just beating really fast. So, um, don't worry, I'll be okay, hopefully. Uh, but it is an honor to speak to the graduates, and we're going to jump right in. And uh, uh, Who has their Bible? I like, I like to pose this question every time I speak in Nexus. Who has their paper Bible with you? Just raise it up. We're going to get a, yeah, I love to see paper Bibles. Phone Bibles are great too, but I just, I like to pose that question every time I speak in Nexus. But we're going to read a little bit here. Uh, we're going to start in Numbers chapter 13, verses 27 through tw- uh, 33, and then we'll read on into Numbers chapter 14, but verse 27 says, then they told him, and let me preface this with the reading of the scripture is, um, what has just proceeded is um, Moses and the children of Israel has sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan to go and see um, how the land was, what, who the inhabitants of the land were, and, and if this was a good land and what they should do next. And so what we're about to read are these spies coming back after a 40-day journey into the land of Canaan, and they're giving their report. So that's where we're going to start, verse 27. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is, and this is its fruit. And as they, they, are, they are referencing these great grapes that were so large that they were carrying it between, two men were having to carry it between two pole, a pole. The cluster of grapes were so large, and that's what he's referencing as the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quietened. Then Caleb quietened the people before Moses and said, Let us go up unto, at once and take possession. For we will be able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight, chapter 14. So all or all the congregations lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept at night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if we only had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us elect a leader and return to Egypt. We're going to go down to verse 6. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, we were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, and he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread, and their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. And just for a couple of moments, I'm going to speak on the topic, the banks of transition. So I began to think about transition, and even before I had been asked to speak, uh, this thought, or, or I'd been reading about the, this thought of every time the children of Israel came to a body of water, uh, it represented a transition and a time of their journey. So if we look at the Red Sea, the Red Sea was a transition from captivity into a time in the wilderness. And then we look at the Jordan River, 
and we look at it twice, what we just read is their first attempt to cross the Jordan, but they hear a bad report, and, and they stop, and, and they, they lose their faith in God, and they become scared. And so what, they, what ends up happening is they're sent back into the wilderness for 40 years. And then we see the second time at the Jordan River uh, that they have faith. And, and Joshua leads Israel across the Jordan into the promised land. But these bodies of water represented transition. And I begin to think about transition. And, and I found this really cool picture And as I uh, searched for transition. And it's the Fraser River in, in Canada meeting the Straits of Georgia. I think we have a picture of this. So this is actually, this is not land and water. This is two bodies of water meeting. Uh, the, the, the darker gray or murky water is the Fraser River. It's the fresh water running into the ocean in the Straits of Georgia. Now, it's not because of the fresh and salt water mi- not being able to mix, but it's actually their sediment in the Fraser River, heavy sediment that's been washed down from the mountains and has traveled this river, and when it meets this salt water, this ocean water, it just kind of stops there, and it appears to be a barrier between the two bodies of water. I thought that was pretty cool. I saw that. That is what I would call a definite transition. Sometimes you can just tell there's a transition from one place to another, and graduates, you're in a definite transition. You are. You're going from high school, and as I heard, most going into college, or you're going into high school into the workforce. Maybe you lived with your parents all your life, but now you're going into a time where you don't have them. You're not living with them. Trust me, I've been doing it for three weeks, and I have not cooked myself a meal once. Gosh. The other day, I just had cinnamon rolls for dinner, which was good, but probably not the best choice. It's tough. It's a transition. I'm still working on that part. I'm going to cook myself tacos tomorrow. Tune in. If you see the fire trucks going off in ward, call me. I might be in trouble. But that is a transition. It's a definite transition. And we meet here with the Israelites standing on the banks of transition. They're standing there on the Jordan River, and they sent these 12 men, these 12 spies, to go out into the land of Canaan and begin to observe and begin to to look around and see if the land was plentiful, to see if the land is as great as they would imagine, to see who the inhabitants were. And I can imagine, because I'm a restless person. You can probably see I've been pacing back and forth. That's just my restless nature. I can imagine as the whole uh, camp of Israel is standing at the, banks of tra- at the banks of the Jordan here, and these 12 spies are gone. Because this was not just a quick journey. This was not just let's throw some clothes in a bag and, and go over and we'll be gone for a couple of days. But you read that they were gone for 40 days. That's a long time. Forty days is a long time to be gone. And I, in my restless nature and in my imaginative mind, I can imagine the Israelites standing at the bank like, where are they? Don't they know they've been gone for ten days? Come on. That's the promised land over there. That's what God has promised us. This whole journey has been for what's over there on the other side. It's been ten days. A couple more days go by. Are you kidding me? It's 20 days. I, what are they doing over there? They must got lost. Uh, Moses, we need to send more people over there. They must have got lost. And their men, they won't ask for directions. We need to send some more people over there. Uh, it was, and then they become restless. 20 days, 30 days, and then finally, for the 40th day, and I can imagine. Oh, this is just my imagination. They're standing at the edge of the river. And someone just kind of opened it up. It's them. I see them. It's the 12 guys, and they're coming back. And, oh, they're carrying something. What is that? It, what is that an ant? No, that is grapes. And I can imagine the excitement because the children of Israel finally are going to have a report on this land that God had promised them. They're excited. that they were filled with anticipation, full of faith of this great report that these men are going to bring them. And I can imagine as they cross the Jordan River, they tap on one of the spies' shoulders and say, hey, 
I'm a farmer. You, you, you know, I like to farm. Did you see any good land for, for, for farming? Did you see anything where I could plant maybe some wheat, maybe some soybeans? And then the hunter said, hey, hey, you know, I'm a big sportsman, and I'm looking down to take down that next trophy buck. Did you see any woods, you know, where I could put a tree stand, and I could sit up there and shoot that trophy buck? And then the fisherman said, hey, how were the seas? Were they rough? Were they calm? Oh, is there, is there plenty of fish to go in? And what kind of fish they were? They were filled with excitement and filled with anticipation. And that's where you guys are. And this is not just for the graduates. This is where we can be in a time of transition, standing on the banks of transition, excited and with great anticipation, saying, I'm ready to see what's on the other side. And I can imagine as they carry those grapes over, they're like, look at those grapes. I don't even like grapes, but they're huge. Look how big they are. I can imagine the, the, the fruit and what's over there. This is going to be so great. But how quickly their attitudes changed. Because that gets me to the first point. During transition, we have to be cautious and very careful in who we allow to speak into our lives. These ten, there was 12 men, but as you read, there's 10 men who come with the bad report. Let's just read it again. It says, they came, let's see, where am I here? 27. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where they sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. They're saying it's truly a great land. It's truly plentiful, just as God has promised, just as we expected. But then they said, but. But they said, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak and the Amalekites and dwelled in the land in the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the bank. And they go on to say, we can't overcome this. And so with the word of those ten men... They began to spread negativity. They began to spread unbelief. They, the, the faith and the anticipation that the children of Israel once had began to dissipate because they began to listen to the men, the ten men who doubted the will of God, who doubted the God's promises. It's so important to make sure we are vetting and, and we're, we're cautious to who we allow to listen to speak into our lives. There was 10 men with a negative report. There was only two with a positive report. That's Caleb and that's Joshua. And so what we can tend to do as humans is just kind of slide over to the negative. It's just human nature. It doesn't matter how positive you are, what outlook you have on life. It, when there is an, if you can choose between a negative and a positive, it's just our human nature. We just like to slide over there. Oh, man, Lord can't believe I'm in this situation when he could be making a way, but we're just so focused on the negative. We're so focused on the report of negativity and because it's so easy to take the report of the majority. It's so, it's so important and graduates, and I'm preaching to everybody here, but graduates, let me tell you, now as this world progresses in the way it's going, the majority most of the time is not correct. The majority has this idea that they're going to live by the standards of the world. And there might be 10 men saying, you know, you, don't, you need to live like this and you need to neglect this. And, and they might be casting ne negativity in your life. But the majority is not always right. The majority is not always right. I can go to work today and I can get all their opinions and I can get all their viewpoints. And let me, I guarantee you that the majority of them will not be speaking the will of God. It will not be speaking the truth because the majority is not always right. Ten out of, ten out of 12, that's majority, but 10 out of 12 were speaking negativity, speaking disbelief. They lost their faithfulness in what God has done. And they said, we can't do this on our own. Israel took the words of these ten men and it became, that negativity became their new identity. Those men, those, those men and women who sat on the bank and said, I just can't wait to get in the promised land. I can just see it now, just my fields of wheat just stretching farther than the eye can see. The Lord has brought me here. The Lord has purposed this just for me. And they, were, they had so much faith and so much expectation. That was their identity. But now the, the voice of these ten men, they began to consume this negativity, consume this disbelief. And it now became their identity. 
It blows my mind how quickly a whole nation can switch their mindsets just because of the voice of 10 men and a negative report. We have to be careful on who we allow to speak into our lives because the enemy, the devil, understands that if he can get your mind, he got you covered. If he can get your mind, you're defeated because, you know what, it doesn't matter how well I can fake it on the outside. It doesn't matter how well I can go through the motions. If the enemy has my mind and I have a negative spirit and I don't believe God can work in my life, the enemy's got me right there. I have to make sure I am vetting, I am seeking out godly men and women, godly men and women to speak into my life. And that's what we see. We see Joshua and Caleb, and it says they, they tear their clothes, and they're saying, wait, 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 uh, listen to our report. I know they have a, re- a bad report, but, but listen to me. Listen to what we have to say, because we went over there. We saw the same things we did, and, and yes, it's a great land, and it flows with milk and honey, and yes, they, they, they might be great, and the inhabitants might be giants, but you know, it said the Lord is with us, and, and it begins to say that he's the dis- First, their protection, and the Lord will bring us through. Do not fear. But the voice they had already consumed, and their identity was already this identity of negativity, of disbelief. And so they looked at him, and Pastor, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but you say, Pastor gave someone some advice. I doubt anybody said, you know what, Pastor, I don't like it. I'm going to stone you. I mean, Pastor, that hasn't happened, have it? Oh, good. I I hope that doesn't happen to me. Danny, has that ever happened to you? Not yet? Well, you better watch out. I got some rocks in my pocket. Uh. But these, the children of Israel looked at these two men and they said, you know what? We don't like what you have to say, so let's pick up rocks and kill you. Let's pick up rocks and stone you. Let me tell you, if the voice in your life is a true spiritual authority and a true man of God, their voice is going to go against the majority. And it's our job not to get offended and get hurt and say, no, 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 I don't like that. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been doing. You don't, you don't see what I'm doing, so I'm just going to cast you away. It's very easy because sometimes the voice of that spiritual authority, that voice uh, of that mentor that we have, that God has placed in our life, it's going to be a difficult conversation. It's going to be a difficult conversation. As I've, I've been going through Purpose Institute, and every time we talk about leadership, we talk about uh, being able to accept criticism and be able to accept correction. In your time of transition, graduates, you have to be able to accept correction. You have to be able to accept correction and not say, you know what, I don't like what you're saying and just throw them out and get bitter and begin to hate that spiritual authority. God has placed them there for correction and to build you up and and to help you go down the path that God had led for you. Look at your neighbor and say, I have to figure out who's speaking in my life. I learned that from pastor. Get someone to Talk to your neighbors so you can take a drink of water. It's a good one, Pastor. I like it. Number two, in times of transition, I have to understand who I'm following or vice versa. I have to understand who's leading me. (laughs) It baffles me. It baffles me every time I read about the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt uh, to the the promised land. Because every time there's something that goes wrong, their immediate immediate action is begin to blame God. And say, hey, why would you bring me out here? Hey, are you wanting us to die? They automatically, it's like they have this short-term memory of what God has done for them. He does a miracle, and then they forget it. And the next time they face a problem, he he does another miracle, but then they forget it. And there's a problem. They become bitter, and and he forgives them and does a miracle. And forgets they had a short-term memory of who had provided for them, who was leading them. You know, and I, I, I um, in our trainings, I work at Arkansas Federal Credit Union, and in our trainings, it, it talks about in business, you need to have a short-term memory. 
You forget your failures. You move on. You look for a success. But I'm going to tell you, in your walk with God, I want to have a long-term memory. I want to see a trial and see a, a, a stronghold in my life. And I want to say, Lord, I see it, but I also remember what you did for me five years ago. I also remember what you did for me last week. I also remember the walls you broke down, the food you provided, the provision that you have placed in my life. I remember what, who is leading me. I remember who is directing me. And see, that's, that's the thing. It's crazy. Israel forgot every time they faced a situation who had led them out of Egypt in the first place. And for crying out loud, they had a, a huge pillar of cloud and pillar of fire as a reminder. And every time, I, every time they face a situation and they face a trial, you know what was there? This pillar of cloud and this pillar of fire reminding them that God was leading them. But every time they forgot, every time they forgot, God didn't say, he didn't go to Moses and said, all right, Moses, here's the deal. I'll get you out of Egypt. You find your own way to Canaan, I'll meet you there. No. He didn't say that. He didn't say, all right, you know, whew, I did my part getting you out of Egypt. I'm kind of tired. I'm going to go up here, sit in heaven. I kind of keep an eye on you a little bit. You need me, call for me. But I'm just going to, you just make your own way. You know the way. That's it. Pass the tree, fork in the road, left. Yeah, that's it. No, he didn't say that the whole time from, from Egypt to the land of Canaan. He was, he was before them. He was leading them. He was guiding them. Everywhere the children of Israel had stepped, God had been before them. And let me tell you, graduates, you might not understand in this transition where you're going, and you might not understand how he's leading you, but just look up because there's God leading you. And he's saying, come on, follow me. I'm walking before you. I'm going before you. I understand the path I I have for you. Don't worry. Don't fret. I am going to protect you. They forgot who was leading them. And every time they faced a situation, their automatic instinct was to go back to their past. They, mistake, they mistook Egypt as a place of comfort. Just because they had maybe a provided meal every day, just because they knew what each and every day set, you can't go back to your past and look at it as comfort. This, Israel wasn't in comfort. They were slaves. They were oppressed. The Pharaoh was over them, and, and he dictated every single thing they did. But every time they got into a tough situation, uh, they just said, oh, let's go back to Egypt. At least how I maybe had a house there. I had a life back there in Egypt, and I kind of knew what was going to happen. I, there was convenience, and, and every, every day I knew that I would go to work, and I would get fed. Let's just go back to Egypt. And that's what the enemy is saying, graduates. Every time you face, he's just saying, go back to where you're living. Go back to your life before God met you. It's way better you see that when you're living for God, you're facing trials and situations. He's saying, go back. Go back there. It's a lot more comfortable. But let me tell you, my comfort is here. My comfort is in the Spirit of God who leads me and follows after me. When I feel uncomfortable, when I might not see, the, my, understand my surroundings, let me tell you, it's a walk with God. And I just, it's a walk with God because when I'm walking, my surroundings are changing. Everywhere I walk, my situation is going to change. But I know that my comfort Comforter is following me every single step of the way. He's, he's my comforter. When I need him, I can cry out, Lord, I need you, and he's there. When I, when I want to read his word, he's there. He comforts me through his prayer, through my prayer. He comforts me through his word. He is my comforter. He is my comforter. I, third point here, I must walk in authority in my transition. Ha. And uh, Sister Ashley, you, you can come. I must walk in authority in my transition. There might have been giants in the land of Canaan. There might have been a great enemy. But I've yet to find someone greater than my God. Yes, graduates, you, uh, I felt this so strongly with prayer. You might walk on to that campus. And you might look all around you, and it might be a foreign place. 
a place you've never been before, but God will direct you there for a reason. You might walk in and you can just feel the spiritual darkness just clouding around you. You can feel the enemy coming around, but it's not you. It's not just your ability and your capability that has to do that. Greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. God is saying, walk in my authority. Walk in my name. I, I just had a picture of some young people walking across the campus and saying, in Jesus' name, I claim this campus. In Jesus' name, I bind every spirit, human or demonic, that would try and disrupt your will for this campus. I claim it in the name of Jesus. Walk in authority. Walk in authority in your transition. Uh, don't get caught up in the unfamiliar places, but walk in authority. God was the same in Egypt in the wilderness as he was in the land in Canaan. His authority is the same then as it is today. Walk in authority. Joshua and Caleb said this. He said, it just stuck out for me. He was talking about going and taking the land of Canaan. It said their protection has departed. You don't see, young people, you don't see the shifting in the spirit of that campus that you're going to walk in. God's been preparing it for you for a long time. He's saying, Lincoln, I know you're going to BB, and I know when you step on there, it might seem like a place of darkness, but I've been preparing it for you. Joel, you might go and you might not know a single person here and you might feel lonely and you might feel afraid, but don't because I prepared it for you. Ha! Ah. The enemy had departed. God had already begun to construct and begin to disperse the enemy that they were going to have to face. He, they had already had the victory. Before they even got to the banks of the river, before they even stepped across into the other side, they had already had the victory because God had departed their enemy. He had cast away their enemy. In my transition, I want to walk in authority. Uh, I can't look at myself as weak. The ten men, when their greatest things is they thought they would have to do it on their own, they say, we're like grasshoppers to these giants. What is God to these giants? He's greater than any enemy, any circumstance. Uh, we can't look at ourselves as weak, as feeble. I receive power when my Lord is living in me. When I receive the Holy Ghost, he said, you will endure power from on high. Huh. I want to walk in that power and authority. And this is not just for a graduation transition. This is for all of us. This is in my life a transition. As, I, as Brother Gaddy said, I'm now a homeowner. And I'm moving. I, I've been the privilege to become the associate past, youth pastor. And this is a transition, but I want to walk in authority. Because in your weakest, when you're in your transition, because you're going into a place that you're unfamiliar. And that is when the enemy is going to begin to attack. That's when the enemy is going to begin to tap on your shoulder and say, look, this is not where you belong. Look, you don't belong here, but you need to look at the devil and say, I come in the authority of the name of Jesus. The Lord has promised me this land. Uh. You, we can stand. The second time Israel comes to the River Jordan, but was the first, the first people to step foot in that river were the ones carrying the Ark of God, of the Covenant which symbolized God's presence, God's spirit. What that, under, what that means to me is that when I'm moving into my promise, I want to make sure God is leading me. He's led you here. He's going to continue to lead you. You continue to submit your life and say, Lord, whatever your will is, he's going to continue to lead you. Sometimes it might not make sense. Sometimes you might not understand it. But just keep seeking. 
keep seeking. We're going to ask all the graduates, to, if you want to come and line up on here, uh, on the front here, and then the parents, please, if you would make your way. We're going to, our church family is going to pray for you. You can kind of just spread out. I know we have a great group of graduates. If y'all can, yeah, y'all just spread out that way for us. And if the parents, you come stand beside them. Because we know this transition just doesn't affect the young men and the young women, but their parents as well. My prayer is, Lord, give these parents wisdom and direction to help guide their kids as they go through this transition. Kids, look around. The voice I was talking about, you have them right beside you. Yes, your pastor's voice, but your mom and dad's voice is just as important. And they have your best interest in mind. Now, church family, if y'all want to come up and just gather in front of some of these graduates. This is a great group. I get to see them every Wednesday, every Sunday. This is a great group. I'm gonna, I hate to... I hate that they're moving the hyphen. I'm a little selfish. I, I wish they would just stay in Nexus. But this is a great group. Hungry for the will of the Lord. Hungry for greater things. So we're going to pray. And if, if you can gather front in, in front of some of the graduates and you can just pray for them, pray for their family, their parents. But we're just going to pray that the Lord would continue to, to the, the open the door for them in this new area of transition. That they would begin to seek after the things of God. Lord, right now, you see these young people, Lord, and you see their obedience to your word. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Yes, I pray. 